it's time to talk about something different now. Um, so we're going to talk about magnetic field diagnostics. And yeah, actually I forgot that I didn't introduce myself. My name is Ivan. I come from Serbia and I'm a visiting faculty here at CU. Although now technically I work for NSO because it's summer months. Okay, and I do, as, I mean, I did introduce myself first day. I mostly do these sorts of things, like inferring physical quantities from the spectra. And what we're going to talk about today is how to measure the magnetic fields. And measure is a wrong word because as Hans said, we can't go and directly measure things with magnetometer or whatever. We can only infer the physical properties from the spectra and the polarization, right? And basically what I want to teach you today, to try to teach you today, is how we get images like this. So when you go to HMI SDO and you look how the sun looks like in the, in the intensity, which means how you would see the sun through the telescope, it would look something like this. Very boring yellow ball with some active regions here. So here we are looking at the photosphere at low resolution. So we can't see granulation, we can't see bright, bright points, we can't see plage, we can't see anything like that. However, somehow we see that the magnetic field uh, per permeates, if that's the correct word, the, the majority of the surface here. And the question is, how do we know that the magnetic field is there? And I'm going to talk about that today. Let's see if this works. And this is one of my favorite videos. I mean, these videos are my favorite type of videos. It's because you see there what we are trying to do with the high spatial and spectral resolution spectral polarimetry. So let's spend some time to explain each of these four, um, four images here. And actually, we could even do some science just by looking at these images here. So first of all, this is not time. It is a video, but it's not showing evolution of anything in time. It's just showing how this piece of the sun here, this relatively small piece of the sun, looks different than each of the wavelengths. And here, here we are basically scanning through the line. This is calcium 8542 line. Its wings, which we are not still reaching here, are probing the photosphere. Actually, the continuum is probing the photosphere. The wings are probing, let's say, granulation inversion layer or something like that. Line core is probing lower chromosphere, so to speak. And so when you look at this image, you see how what we see changes with looking at different wavelengths. And it's exactly the consequence of the things that Han and me tried to show to you in the previous session, right? When I'm in the line core, I'm seeing much, much higher, re, uh, higher layers. When I'm in the line wings, I see much, much deeper layers. And I always like to contrast this to this famous image of galaxy at different wavelengths. And if you are a standard astrophysicist, you would usually say different wavelengths mean different objects, right? If I'm looking galaxy in gamma rays, I'm seeing gamma ray bursts and things like that. If I'm seeing at, at infrared, I see the dust. If I'm looking at optical, I see old stars. If I'm looking at UV, I see young stars, and so on and so on. In sun, it's a little bit different. When we look at different wavelengths, we look at different layers. Eventually, when we reach corona, then when we look at different wavelengths, we look at different temperatures. But it's also different layers in a way. Okay. However, we are not only analyzing the intensity, we are also analyzing the polarization. And here is a map at circular polarization at these wavelengths, and here of the linear polarization. Sadly, I couldn't write it in Q and U because number of four panels is much nicer than five panels, right? So I just added X and Q, uh, Q and U together. But focus on V at the moment. What we see here is that we are, when we are close to the line core, we see some patterns appearing there, and we see that they change sign on both sides of the, of the line core. And actually what I'm going to show you today is that the signal in Stokes V and also in Stokes Q and U corresponds most often to the locations where we have magnetic field. And linear polarization tells us something about the transversal magnetic field. Circular polarization tells us something about line of sight magnetic field. Okay, cool. Well, let's talk about it a little bit. Sorry, wrong direction. And what I usually like to show after that is how actual profiles look like. These are from my, okay, Valentin is not here, from my favorite telescope, which is Hinode. And the reason why it's favorite is just because it's, somehow you can count on it, you know? You go in there and it's a website and there's data, you download the data, you work with it. And hopefully we will be able to do that with Dickies too. And these are the shapes of the, I mean, obviously the downside is that we only have these two spectral lines. With Dickies we will have much, much, much more. 
So what you see here is the intensity Q, U, and V for one pixel, OK? So with high resolution spectropolarimetry, we are obtaining the data cubes, right? We are always obtaining something like x, y, lambda at these four Stokes parameters. So what you see here is something that you're all probably used to by now, two old boring absorption lines. However, when you look at the circular polarization plot, you see that outside of the lines, polarization is zero. But in the lines, there is some signature in the circular polarization and in the linear one, too. So there has to be something happening in the line processes that creates the polarization. And that is, so here is a brief reminder on what polarization actually is. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But we are going to see now that the reason for polarization in spectral lines is most often the magnetic field. OK. So what, what is polarization? You probably remember from your electromagnetics cla uh, uh, electromagnetism classes that you can have two independent electric vectors propagating at perpendicular directions at, uh, along L in this case. So we can have oscillations in EX and oscillations in EY which are, don't affect each other and corresponding magnetic field oscillations, of course. And then these two could have any sort of phase shift between them and any sort of amplitudes, right? If I have only one oscillation direction, then it's, linear, then it's linearly polarized wave along x or y. If I have them both, let's say they have same magnitude, but their phase is the same, then I can just add them and I will get basically again a linearly polarized wave at 45 degrees, right? And in this case, what we see is that if we have these two of, let's say, the same amplitude, but there is a phase shift between them of pi half, then I will get what we call circularly polarized light. It's that when, for example, EX is in maximum, AY is in minimum, and vice versa. So it seems to us when we measure here that it's circularly, that basically the, the, the vector of the electric field is making a circle, right? And there are ways to measure this, and we basically measure this by inserting linear polarizers and something called retarders in our optical, is it called optical train? I guess so. Uh, and in our optical path. And then by modifying orientation of these, we can measure various combinations of I, Q, U, and V, and finally extract the actual values of I, Q, U, and V from that. And that's what Christian yesterday called modulation. OK, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk how we get these. And if I tell you that it's Zeman effect, some of you will be like, yeah, of course it's Zeman effect. We know about this. Show us what, what's next. But some of you will be, wow, why is it Zeman effect? So if you were in my situation five years ago, it wouldn't be very obvious to you why Zeman effect creates line polarization. Because when they teach you Zeman effect in quantum mechanics, they don't say anything about polarization. At least they didn't in my class. What we are usually taught is that Zeman effect is, uh, is, is a basically a perturbation of the Hamiltonian of the atom that splits the energy levels. And then instead of one spectral line, we see multiple spectral lines. And that's actually what these amazing people, so look at the list of the authors, right? Hale, then Ellerman from Ellerman Bobbs, and Joy from Joy's Law. And I'm really sorry that I don't know who Nicholson is, but maybe somebody else in the room does. Uh, what they did was that they, actually I think it was Hale alone, they put a spe he put a spectrograph slate over the sunspot and then this is how the, the spectra looked back then. So this is a photograph of basically some screen. And then what you see here is that in the quiet sun, we have one spectral line. When we reach the sunspot, it splits in multiple spectral lines. And this is the actual proof that sunspots harbor magnetic fields. So sunspots are not planets that sun has swallowed or something like that. This was actually the proof that the sunspots are the concentrations of the magnetic field. And it was, well, just some years after Peter Zeman, Dutch scientist, got Nobel Prize for discovering Zeman effect in laboratory. And today, with, uh, with Hinode, we can see very clearly how this splitting looks like, because we can digitalize everything. So when we are in the quiet sun, we, did, we see two iron lines, completely normal, not split at all. As we are going from the quiet sun to the umbra, we see lines which are, first, first you just see them uh, like broadened, but then actually you see them split. And basically from the amount of splitting here in wavelength, 
you could derive the magnetic field. And people were doing it like that for quite some time. And if you were in Sebastian's talks, you see that we, in the examples of very strong magnetic fields, we see this splitting really, really clearly. But there are better ways to deduce the magnetic field. For example, if the magnetic field is really weak, you won't see this effect very clearly because different broadening mechanisms compete. Turbulent velocities, temperature, uh, effects of the telescope, and so on and so on. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the polarization. And this is something that I really, really wish that somebody told me at least five years ago, and that is how Zeman effect is creating the polarization. And to analyze that, the first requirement is that energy levels cannot be really, really simple. So energy levels have to have some degeneracy. What does degeneracy mean? It basically means that if I put my level in a, so this is operational definition. It definitely doesn't mean that. It means, but operational definition for us would be if I put my level in a magnetic field, it splits. And actually the number of levels here, number of split, these split levels, E, or number of sublevels, as I'm going to call them, depends on the total angular momentum quantum number of the level. So here we have the lower level with j. j is the total angular momentum quantum number with j equals 0. And up here we have a level with j equals 1. Okay. And we always have 2j plus 1 sublevels. So here we have 1 sublevel, here we have 3 sublevels. So instead of having only one transition between these two levels, we have three of them. And they have different changes of now we have to introduce a new quantum number, which I will call magnetic quantum number, which we will call, surprise, surprise, m. And here we have m equals 1, m equals 0, m equals minus 1, and here is m equals 0, right. So there are changes in the... And these actually, for those of you who remember quantum mechanics, m gives you information. It's basically the quantum number that describes the value of the projection of the angular quantum uh, number on some predetermined axis. And in our case, that axis is going to be the axis of the magnetic field orientation. Okay? So what happens then? The thing that happens then is that individually looking, each of the photons created in these transitions is 100% polarized. That's one ingredient that we need to understand polarization because of the Zeman effect. The other ingredient is that different, and this is really, this was really mind-blowing for me, the different transitions here corresponds to different changes in the angular momentum, okay? And one of the consequences of that is that if I have photons that are coming along the magnetic field, they can only be absorbed or emitted in these transitions from 1 to 0 and from minus 1 to 0. And the reason for that is that the change of the angular momentum quantum number in these transitions is 1. And in the process of absorbing or emitting a photon, I need to conserve this angular momentum. And the photons that travel parallel to the magnetic field, they have angular momentum of 1. Okay? So this is really what happens. And, and, it, and it's really, for me, it was really like, wow. So this is why it happens. And then when we look perpendicular to the magnetic field, all the photons have uh, uh, zero, and actually all of these transitions are, are zero, because in a way also pro your projection of the angular momentum quantum number on this axis is zero. Okay, so we, we need all, also I would benefit from that, and if you want to know more about that, we can sit and look at some quantum mechanics together. But what happens then is that when I'm looking parallel to the magnetic field, I'm only seeing fo I, only the photo, only photons that, uh, actually only transitions that are participating in absorption and emission are these transitions from 1 to 0 and from minus 1 to 0. Okay. And it turns out that when you do a lot of operator algebra and things like that, it turns out that these two transitions correspond to positively and negatively pol circularly polarized light. Okay. And in the absence of the magnetic field, these two would completely cancel each other. However, when we introduce the magnetic field, what happens? One level goes a little bit up, one level goes a little bit down, positive circular polarization shifts a bit to the red, negative circular polarization shifts a bit to the blue, and they're not completely canceling anymore, but they're producing this characteristic anti-symmetric shape in circular polarization. Okay. So once again, 
I always have these sublevels, and, and the transitions in them are always 100% polarized. But in the absence of the magnetic field, they all have exactly the same energy. They all have exactly the same wavelength, and they're completely canceling each other, right? These two, m, m plus 1 to 0 and m minus 1 to 0. They're completely canceling each other. When I turn on the magnetic field, one shifts to blue, the other one shifts to red, and suddenly they cannot cancel each other completely, and I get this. You can make a plot like this at your computers, shift these two by some amount. The more you shift them, the bigger this signature in between is. Okay. What happens with the linear polarization? Of course, interrupt me as I go. I know that I shout a lot and that it's very frightening. But uh, interrupt me. Don't, uh, don't be afraid. Right? When I look perpendicular, it's very similar. I see these circular polarizers, that's a classical interpretation, now as linear oscillators, so they produce a linear, linear polarization. I see the other component as linear polarization of other sign and also stronger. So what I have is two negative linear polarizations and one two times stronger positive one. If they were all exactly overlapping, there would be zero polarization. In the, absence of the, in the presence of the magnetic field, they split in energy, and I get net, I get net linear polarization, which looks like this. It's very, very characteristic shape, and they actually look like the Hinode profiles that we saw here, right? V looks like hop, Q looks like hop like this, U in this case. I'm not sure what, what hop was meant to be, but yeah. it's, it's uh, still traces of, of Serbian things in me. OK, anyway, uh, what happens now? OK, for some reason we don't see the image. Let's try again. Okay, this, is super, this is super weird. I'll just, I'll just show it to you like this. Never happened before. So now we have seen things here which showed us what happens in the individual atoms. But in the same way that in Hans' lecture we saw that these simple, apparently simple absorption and emission processes which happen in individual atoms, they conspire that we have to solve the radiative transfer problem through the whole atmosphere in order to get emergent spectra. In the same way, we need to solve polarized radiative transfer problem to get emergent polarized spectra. And now if you remember, the radiative transfer equation had this very deceptively simple form at single wavelength, is that the change of the intensity is proportional to the intensity minus the source function. Then you integrate this, you get some integral. That's basically what we did in the exercise. However, when we go to the polarized case, our intensity becomes a four vector, right? Also, our source function becomes a four vector because although in Zeman case there is no polarized emission, there can be polarized emission, for example, through scattering processes. And finally, our opacity, or scaling in a way, something that I will call here absorption matrix, needs to become a four times four matrix, which basically describes how all these things work together. So now, if I'm given a model atmosphere, which also involves the magnetic field, what I need to do is I need to calculate all these quantities and then solve this differential equation here. And today we're actually going to do it in a very, very simplified form. OK, so this is how it looks when we write it in the explicit way. It's very, OK, very. It's fairly complicated. Scattering polarization is very complicated. This is fairly complicated. So what we see here, and there is a typo here, this is also eta i is that actually we are writing the, the differential. What you get is four coupled differential equations, right? So d over dz of i would be, and then I need to mu multiply this vector with this matrix, and then you would get that all four Stokes parameters are coupled together here. And then I have these, the things that go into this matrix are actually, so forget this for the moment, these are actually the various combinations of these three profiles that I have shown you previously, okay? So before we had only one line, 
right? We had one line profile and that was used for absorption and emission. Now I have multiple sub-transitions. Each of them has their own profile. I'm somehow combining them, putting them in this matrix here, and then solving this radiative transfer equation here, which is now much more tricky. Okay, you have all the, these things that have literally been copied and pasted from the book of Jose Carlos del Toro Iniesta, Introduction to Spectropolarimetry. So I really suggest that you all take a look at that book. It's very concisely written and has a lot of useful resources. Cool, okay. So then let's talk about this a little bit more. How would the, uh, a scheme to synthesize the spectra look like? And it, this is also generally true for the, for the for the unpolarized light as well. So if you are given a model atmosphere, basically what you need to calculate is first to solve ionization and excitation of your medium to see how many of the, of the particles that are capable of absorbing and emitting you have in your atmosphere at each depth. Then you can calculate these absorption, I also call them here dip dispersion, so you have see, seen that psi profiles in the atmosphere then we set up all the quantities needed for the polarized, polarized radiative transfer equation, and then you solve it, and then you are only interested in what comes out, right? And of course, we can't do that now. There are codes that solve this thing, and it's a lot of work to write these things, code, these codes. But the thing that you should remember is that, in principle, emergent spectra from the atmosphere depends on all the quantities and all the values along the line of sight. Some are more important, some are less important, but strictly, mathematically speaking, since we are solving radiative transfer equation in a longer direction, all the quantities contribute to the final result. Cool, but we're not here for that. We're here for some practical things, right? We are here to try to solve this problem as good as we, could, as we can. So here on the left-hand side, you have one model atmosphere extracted from a Bifrost simulation Right? Here you have a run of the temperature with the optical depth, total particle density, magnetic field, and the line of sight velocity. Here you have the shapes of some spectral lines, and you have the, the intensity and the circular polarization. So we're not here to talk about modeling. Tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about the inverse problem, which means how to deduce these from these. Short answer, it's impossible, but we are still trying because we can sort of do it. Uh, but to, to solve the inverse problem, you need to solve the forward problem. So you always need to have a model for what's happening with your data. Okay. So the problem, the main problem is that all this is very, very, very cumbersome. And in principle, it's a, it deserves a conference on, on its own. So we're not going to talk about it. We are going to take a small detour to show you one other physical effect that produces polarization and that we hope to exploit much, much more with DKIST. And that's line scattering polarization. Okay. And what is line scattering polarization? Let's first discuss what is line scattering. Can anybody tell me what line scattering is? Come on, feel free. Your best shots. Huh? Come on, Lily. Okay, but how is line scattering different from, for example, electron scattering? No, no, line, line corresponds to spectral line. It's not, it's not like line scattering, it's not like line scattering like along some line. No, no, this is spectral line scattering. They don't change their, basically, they don't change their energy. That's... That's co technically correct, but it's very hard to entangle now. Is there a simpler answer? Um, okay, so let's break one big, we were just they're discussing. Not, they're not coupled to the gas condition that is right there. Also true. Yeah. But let's explain this in, a, I hope, the simplest possible way. So we were discussing this on the, on the break. Can anybody tell me what happens after we have an absorption process? So we have a line, and there comes the photon with just the right energy. It gets absorbed. What happens after that in the solar atmosphere? Um, so it either, uh, so the photon, it either um, takes an electron and... No, no, so, no, no. So we have the photon. It's absorbed. Electron is excited. 
What happens after that? Yes, or? Or it could uh, cause some stimulated emission. No, it doesn't have to be stimulated emission. It can just go back and radiate. Right yeah. yeah. So when we have excited electron after the absorption process, mm -hmm. it can usually people say, yeah, then it goes down and it emits a photon. That's not true. For most of the light coming from the sun, that's not true. Most of the light and most of the lines we are interested in are formed in the photosphere. And photosphere is dense enough that after this excitation process, the collision will happen immediately after that, and the energy of the photon will be eaten. It will be turned into thermal energy of the gas. And, and we call that photon will be completely destroyed, right? The point is that, uh, in principle, it should heat the, the medium. But since the medium is equilibrium, then somewhere else in the gas, or somewhere else, locally somewhere, or some other uh, atom, becomes collisionally excited and produces a photon, right? But the point is that this rate, this ratio between this production and this absorption uh, and this destruction depends on the temperature of the gas, right? Cold, ga cold gas, for example, absorbs a lot but doesn't emit a lot because there is not enough collision. And actually, the ratio between these processes of, is your source function. And in LTE, your source function is Planck function, right? So that's, that's what happens in lines. Line scattering is what you most of the time think about. Line scattering, spectral line scattering, is the absorption of the light followed by the immediate de-excitation and the production of the basically identical photon which travels in a random direction. And it seems like scattering, but it's a sort of a quantum process. Now, if somebody here really knows quantum mechanics, they're going to call on me and they're, they're going to say that every scattering process can be represented through virtual states and so on and so on. But let's not go there. Cool. And this is how we get non-LTE lines. This is how H alpha is formed, how magnesium B is formed, how cal calcium H and K are formed. They're non-LTE lines. There is a lot of scattering into them. So if you see scattering dominated lines or non-LTE lines, that's basically the same thing. Cool. What is, however, line scattering polarization? We know that scattering produces polarization. Can anybody tell me why scattering, for example, off the surface of the lake will produce polarization? What's the reason for that? What's the law that, that produ produces that thing? Come on. Yes, Piyush. Exactly. Or in a different way, your components of the of the your components of the electric field they need to be continuous, right? So so if I have a we, we can plot that for example here, very small. But if I have ah, I cannot. Okay. Anyway, uh, basically the point is that if I have the let's say that I have radiation which is only oscillating along our z, okay, and the ray is traveling like this. And then when it scatters up there, basically nothing will scatter because I can't have electric field which continues oscillating like this, right? Only the components which are oscillating along this direction will scatter this way. So that will cause the polarization, OK? One direction is absorbed and one is reflected. You could say that. Yeah, yeah, you could say that, yes. OK. So you could say ad hoc that in spectral lines similar things are happening. But the point is that this is so interesting from physics point of view that we really hope to sort of make some discoveries with Dickist. So I'm going to spend some time telling you about this. And the reason for line scattering polarization is very similar to Zeman effect, actually. So you need to come, and here we have reverse case. Here we have an upper level, which is unsplit, and the lower level, which is split in three with m equals 1, 0, minus 1. The upper one has m equals 0. And now what I'm doing is I'm illuminating my absorbing atoms anisotropically. So in first case, I'm only illuminating them from below. Here, I'm only illuminating them from the sides. When I'm illum illuminating, and now my uh, coordinate of choice is z, right? Before, I had to choose magnetic field as my, as my coordinate. Here, I'm choosing just the atmospheric atmospheric normal. So if I'm illuminating from below, then because of the conservation of the angular momentum, I can only absorb 
from 1 to 0 and from minus 1 to 0, right? Which means that ML equals 0 level, will not, I won't absorb from that one. So basically what will happen is that these levels will become unevenly populated. And now, in the photosphere, there will be enough collisions to move these little black dots from one level to the other one, and this une uneven population would disappear. But in the chromosphere, because there are not enough collisions, we, we have this. And similarly, if I'm only illuminating from the sides, which is again anisotropic, because there is no illumination above and below, what I get is now M0 is depopulated, because it's only absorbed from that one, and here you see these gray lines, they show you that the, that the de-excitation events, they don't discriminate, right? There is always the same amount of de-excitations everywhere, but mo absorptions only follow from these directions here. And what this then creates is the following situation. Now what I have, I again have in linear polarization the situation that these things should cancel in principle, but now because these things are not evenly populated, I have some net remaining linear polarization here. And these signatures are super subtle. So if in Zeman effect we were talking about per few percent or 10 percent polarization, in line scattering polarization we have fractions of percent. And that's why it's very, very hard. You remember maybe Valentin said, Akim Gandorfer did the second solar sun atlas at McMath with 10 to the minus 5 polarimetric precision, right? Locarno. Locarno. Why did he say McMath? I also thought that it was Locarno. I think they did something about math. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, that's true, but that person integrated a huge chunk of the sun for 45 minutes or something like that. Now with telescope as decays and with new coefficient cameras and things like that, we hope to be able to see these effects and their variation in the field of view. Okay? So we, we really hope to see signature of these, develops in, of these events in the individual spectra of individual pixels and to be able to use them to put some more constraints on the, on the physics of the solar atmosphere. And we are already doing that in prominences. So prominences, they are elevated a little bit. So they are really anisotropic, anisotropically illuminated because they are high above the, above the surface. Plus, they are basically only scattering. Prominences are purely scattering objects. So in prominences, this linear polarization can reach few percent. And then people have been doing it. Like, for example, Roberto Cassini from HAO. Cool. But let's go back. And before that, let's just review what are the things that are happening that produce polarization in the, in the solar atmosphere. So if we only have scattering, what we will get, we'll have, for example, in the case of simple absorption line, because I'm not going to go into reasons for anisotropic illumination, but Han sort of mentioned it. So you can go through his slides again and try to deduce, and who guesses correctly, we'll get some reward before the end of the school. Uh, we have linear polarization in the lines like this. Then something that I didn't mention, which is another amazing physical effect called Hanle effect, is that if we now put these scattering atoms in the magnetic field, some of this Q will be rotated into U. Okay? So if we see scattering polarization both in Q and U, it means that we have, it most often means that we have magnetic field. It, there are also other very sophisticated radiative transfer effects that can, actually not sophisticated, just, okay, we can talk about this later too. Basically, it's a signature of 3D processes. And then finally, if we have strong magnetic fields, then the line produces Zeman signatures, and we can even, in the very extreme cases, have line splitting. Okay, and most, most often by now, we have exploited this effect here because it's much easier to model from theoretical point of view. But we really hope to do this. So if there are people here in this room who are interested in scattering polarization, DKIST might be an opportunity for you to see something new. And this would really be a discovery, right? Okay, so basically your takeaways for now are that the spectral lines are very, I mean, from the, this whole afternoon session, is that spectral lines are amazing because opacity changes really quickly over the small range of wavelengths, so you get a sample range of heights, 
plus they are sensitive to velocities, right, continuum can't have blue and red shift. I mean, it can, but we would have to have hundreds of thousands of kilometers per second, right? But with lines, we can measure less than kilometer per second shifts, right? And then the lines also exhibit, they, they are sensitive to the magnetic field and to the scattering. Okay, so what we're gonna to do today, let's see if this, if this improved. Oh, amazing, okay, great. So our final product, which we will talk about tomorrow a little bit, is basically we go from these cubes of the observables. So here you are just see, looking at the intensity and the linear uh, circular polarization at one, at, at, at one wavelength, so to speak. But we have these observations at many wavelengths. We can use these many wavelengths and X and Y dependencies to construct the maps of physical parameters at different heights. So I'm gonna show you more examples of this tomorrow. But here you have an example how by analyzing spectra of sodium D, we get temperature distribution in the photosphere, temperature distribution in the upper photosphere, which doesn't look nothing like this, velocity distribution in the photosphere, which shows the signature of convection, but also velocity distribution of the chromosphere. Okay, temperature minimum. And then again, magnetic field in the photosphere and in the temperature minimum. And they look different, always. Cool. But today we're going to do something much more simple. We're going to explore and code and test the most simple way for magnetic field diagnostics, which is called weak field approximation. In the weak, and this is going to be weak field approximation only for the circular polarization. Okay. And in this approximation, we assume that all the elements of the transfer equation are zero except the diagonal. And basically, the, the diagonal uh, describes good old absorption. Okay, just the standard absorption. This is like your absorption coefficient. And then there is this eta v, which basically describes how i and v and v and i interact. So if I was going to write this as, if I was going to write all these differential equations separately, it would simplify to these two differential equations like this, okay? And then some of you already know the trick because you attended collage, right? What I can do is I can add these two to cancel, sorry, there is one, uh, there is one minus sign, I think, no, okay, I guess it's okay. I can add and subtract, subtract these equations and I would get something like this. I would get two separate radiative transfer equations, one for I plus V, one for I minus V, okay? So these are like the good old scalar radiative transfer equations. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce some notations here. Actually, it's not, gonna introduce, it's not introducing notations, it's actually going and looking back into these expressions. But I'm not gonna bother you too much with it. You can go on your own and explore further. But in principle, it turns out that when I add eta i and eta v, it's like the absorption only by the red component. And when I subtract eta i and eta v, it's like the absorption only by the blue component. So because of these things, I'm gonna call i plus v i red. I'm gonna call i minus v i blue. So I have now two different radiative transfer equations, one for i red, one for i blue. And the only difference between this equation and this equation is that in one I have phi red, in one I have phi blue, okay? And then if we were to plot it in the absence, so we saw it in the, in the previous workshop, in the absence of any magnetic field, I would get one absorption line. But now I have, instead of my standard absorption profile, I have this one which is shifted to the blue, one which is shifted to the red. So I'm gonna get one absorption line which is shifted to the blue and one for the red. These are not real things. These are what would happen if we solve the radiative transfer equation for I plus V and I minus V. But we use it to, to derive, okay? So here is basically what we see. We see that red intensity is actually original intensity shifted by the appropriate amount. Blue intensity is original intensity, again, shifting in the other side by appropriate amount. And then we use the favorite tool of any physicist or astronomer, and that is 
the, I always forget the name also, Taylor expansion, right? I even remember Maclaurin expansion, but Taylor expansion, I always forget the name. So basically what we do is we say, okay, our red component is actually original component, but shifted. So how am, how am I gonna write it? I'm gonna write it as the original component minus the derivative of the original component times the shift. And the same for i plus v. And then finally, I subtract these two to get Stokes v, and I will get that Stokes v is equal to derivative of the Stokes i with respect to lambda, and times this thing here, which as you see depends linearly on magnetic field, quadratically on the line core wavelength, something called Lande factor, which basically describes how susceptible the line is to the magnetic field and a bunch of constants. So basically we get that our Stokes V is linear function of the derivative of the Stokes I with respect to the lambda. What is the condition that we use to derive this? Well, there are two main approximations. One is that only eta V was important in the radiative transfer. The other one was that this delta lambda B was small, so we could use Taylor expansion here. Cool. So now what are we going to do? And if you go to your, uh, if you go to the folder of the exercise, you will find there are a lot of files. There are some IDL save files, which might be good for do, those of you who like IDL save files, or if you want me to show you how to load IDL save files in Python, which also can be done. However, there are also two FITS files which contain the data. In the data, we have spectra of two spectral lines. Okay, we have one region observed in iron, 6302.5 and calcium 8542, full Stokes polarimetry. Okay, so we have the profiles of these spectral lines at each wavelength. It's basically like the data that I used to make the video. Okay, and what we are going to do is we're going to use the weak field approximation to calculate the magnetic fields. Okay, so we're going to calculate this derivative here and do a linear fit to obtain the magnetic field. Cool. So basically, those of you who, who did this already and are like, ha ha, I don't have to do this. Well, this is not something that is just, you know, something that I show uh, at, at, at lectures and try to convince people what is M and effect. Actually, this is a method that is still used in solar physics. And the plan is that this will be a default interpretation technique to interpret data from VTF. So let's make a small uh, a con contest here. If you are bored but what I'm going to do, sit and try to code big field approximation which will calculate magnetic field for whole VTF field, which is like 16 million spectra. And the plan is to have these 16 million spectra obtained in 13 seconds. So if you can write a fitting procedure which calculates magnetic field in less time than that, for the, so less than 13 over 16 million times per spectra, you can go up there and knock on Valentin's door and you are absolved from this class. <laughs> and maybe he will give you a job, I don't know. Okay, anyway, for the other ones who never saw this, let's do this, okay? So what we need to know is we need to know line core wavelengths. Ah, let's also use these remaining two minutes that I planned for, for, for talking to discuss one big misconception. Here you see that splitting is proportional to the line core wavelength. And people use this to very often tell you infrared lines are better because the Zeeman effect scales quadratically with the wavelength. Have you who heard that expression before? A lot of you. That's technically true, except it doesn't scale quadratically, but it scales linearly. Why? Because V will not depend only on this, but also on the derivative. Further you are in infrared, wider the lines are, because the width of the line in kilometers per second is always the same, but when you translate that to the wavelength, it's bigger and bigger as I'm going to infrared, which means that this derivative here is less and less steep. So actually that increase in the width of the line, which is linear with wavelength, will compensate for one for, for one uh, degree here. So in the end, if you were really to calculate the, the dependency of V on the wavelength, it would actually be linear. 
So it's true, infrared lines are better for Zeeman effect, but they are not quadratically better, okay? So signal actually that you see is not, yes? I mean, you are correct, but the split is proportional to the square. Split is proportional to the square, but your ability to resolve the, the, the split is only proportional to the valent. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously the split is proportional to the square. Cool. Let's, yes. The range of lambda factors, okay, excellent question. For the lines that we are gonna deal today, it's gonna be, for 6302, it's 2.5, which is really big value. So I think the biggest one is like three, 3.5. Yeah, the one that we know. For calcium line is 1.10. For classical Zeman triplet, which would be ideal line, which has lower level J zero, upper level one, is one. And for most lines, if it is much, it, it's in range between, let's say, 0 0.5 to 2, 2.5, something like that. For molecules, it can be much lower. Yeah, but usually these are the, I mean, of course, for some lines, it can be zero. And then these lines are super useful because we can use them to calibrate various things because they are completely immune to the magnetic field. So if you see polarization there, it comes through because of something else. Okay, cool. Let's then look at our data. So actually, I don't know if anybody show, if you had the chance here, let me close all the things we did before. If you get a chance to actually look at some data in, in real life. So I'll go exit here and I'll go exit like this. I'll open another one and zoom it for you people. So I only downloaded one. So is this scan from 28th January, scan, can eight from this, this date, probably 28th of January 2007. So let's go to Python. And I'm gonna try and be a little bit slower now. So we're gonna need Matplotlib. We're gonna need something to read fits. So usually I do something like this. It's in package AstroPy, the one that I usually use. So now, now we can open FITS files. And when you open FIT file in Python, it's something like this. I usually call them temp. Is FITS open. And you do scan this. And then you can look at this structure that is created. It's, uh, so it's an object that contains four arrays, right? And these are the, the transposed arrays. So when we extract them, they will be completely transposed. So this is your number of X pixels, Y pixels, four for four polarization stages. Yes, Ryan? Um, why is it transposed in the file? I got no idea. Like that's what they, maybe, I don't know if it's only in Python implementation or in general, but that's what they do with some things. And 26 is the number of wavelength points. This, the, then this array with 26 uh, things is actual wavelength grid. So these are actually values of the wavelength with respect to the line core. And this first two combination, uh, the, the first two arrays are for iron line, second two, arrays, uh, second two arrays are for calcium line. So you see that the number of points is not exactly the same, but don't worry about it. Let's take one of them. So let's call this Stokes FE, and I'm gonna put my, my Stokes cube here, and I'm gonna do it this way. Temp zero, data. And then if I look at Stokes FE, shape, you see that it's four dimensional array, so this is a Stokes cube. Probably the products that we'll get from Dickist when you get them finally to, to extract your physical quantities and write your papers will look something like this. Cool, so let's look at this. So the first one is X coordinate, then Y coordinate, then Stokes parameter, then wavelength. So the easiest thing to do first is to look if everything is correct, right? And one way to do it is just do PLT, image show. Image show shows you 2D array, okay? And 2D array that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look at the Stokes I, at the wavelength zero. Usually wavelength, wavelength zero is somewhere close to the continuum. So I'm gonna do something like this, Stokes. So this means shows me all X's, all Y's, zero component for, for Stokes intensity, and then 
0 here. Okay, and since Jana said that default is bad, we're going to use magma. Sorry, Stokes is not defined because it's called Stokes FE. Yes. Yes. Yes, you're right. I need to do origin equals lower. Yes, you're right. So it will look like this. Cool. And this actually looks reasonable. Let's zoom this a bit and see what this is. And to be like really, really cool, let's add the color bar. Color, color bar. Nice. So what we see here are the two things. One thing is that we see something that looks like the surface of the sun. So there is a sunspot, there is granulation, there are some penumbral filaments, there are some pores. But we see that units are not what we are used to. So these are some units, these are some counts. Okay. But we don't care because our method relies, the only thing that our method needs is to match this derivative to this value. So if they're both in counts, that's perfectly fine. Okay. But what you could do in principle, if you wanted to express this in some other units, you could calculate the mean value of the quiet sun, compare, compare it with an absolute measurement, and then use it to calibrate these pixels here. Cool. Let's look at the Stokes V. Uh, Ivan, yes. Did you guys have the chance to download the data? Did you have it? And because it was so big, I don't know if you know, it takes Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you downloaded the data? If you want to do the exercise, I mean, I'm not really going to whip you to, to, to do it. But it's, everything should be there, right? OK, great, great. OK, cool. Anyway, let's look now at something else. Let's clear this. And let's plot. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to do the following. I'm going to plot Stokes V. But I'm also going to put uh, upper and lower limit. So let's say lower limit. I oh, know I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to plot it like this. Cool. So we see something, but it's really ugly, right? We see some signature here. And let's do something with, that people usually do when they want to, to visualize things. Let's do like this. So I'm going to clear this. I'm going to calculate the mean quiet sun continuum. Okay, it's going to be something like, ah, I need to import NumPy first. So let's say mean quiet sun continuum is NP mean of Stokes FE, right? So this is, so this is the mean value, which means averaged over the space. So it's not really mean quiet sun continuum because I have a huge sunspot there, but close enough. Okay, right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plot this. Divided by quiet sun, right? So it gives me sort of fractional polarization in a way. Cool. I mean, of course, the image still looks the same because I just divided it with a constant. But if I do color bar now, you will see that values are relatively small, right? Actually, the majority of the photo has zero. Has zero polarization. Why is it so? Why do not I see a very nice shape? Yes, Ryan? Amazing. Okay, amazing. Let's do the following exactly like that. So let's complete the complete uh, complete calculate the mean spectrum. Something like this. Zero. Uh, this x is equals zero one. Cool. Then I get mean spectrum, which is just the mean intensity. I'll clear the plot. And I will plot the mean. Cool. This is how the mean shape of the line. So let's look not exactly at the line core, but somewhere of the line core. Let's look at the valent number 10, something around here. Cool. So I'll clear this again, and I'll do the same thing as I did here, except for the valent 10. Much better. And we usually don't want magma. Magma is for things that go from 0 to 1, roughly. We want something else. What is best, Neeraj? 
Which one? B W R like this. Cool. Oh, this is much cooler, right? So now we see positive and negative signatures and so on. And actually, if you really want to visualize this nicely, what you should do is you should set limits to make sure that it's symmetric on both sides, right? So let's do something like this, minus 0.2. This means 20, negative 20%, positive 20%. Okay, it's cool, right? Can anybody tell me why is Umbra white? Although magnetic field there should be super strong. Hmm? Well, we are looking, well, it is radi well, it's radial because radial direction is this one, right? So I should have a lot of polarization. Well, the reason is because intensity here is low and I divided every, so I'm looking at the absolute values of Stokes V, right? So Stokes V, for example, if I have very bright object, which is little, po which is not, not much polarized, and a very dark object, which is a lot polarized, Stokes V still gives you sort of number of l circularly polarized photons. So, so here we are still seeing small Stokes V, although fractional polarization here is very large. There is another region, reason, and that could be that molecules are eating up something, but let's not go discussing into that. Let's see how weak field approximation works. So let's pick a pixel. And since I meddled with this data already, I know which my favorite pixel is, okay? So I'm gonna go and plot pixel. So now we're gonna plot spectra. So you can use wavelength now. Did I get wavelength? I didn't. Okay, let's get wavelength. Okay, uh, let's call it just V if E is equal temp one data, right? So these are now wavelengths with respect to the line core. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do PLT plot, wavelength versus, so Stokes F E. I think my favorite one is 130, 100 and, uh, 350. And let's look at Stokes I first. So there is some absorption there. And actually you see that line is sort of broad, which implies that there could be some magnetic forces there, right? But what we are interested in is not Stokes I, we are interested in Stokes V, right? So let's just plot it. We can over plot it here just to see how that would work, but we'll have to zoom later. So yeah, you sort of see, so first of all, the first thing that you see here is that the number of circularly polarized photons is much smaller than the total number of photons, right? Okay, so this is Stokes V in, the, in some absolute units. But we can recognize this shape here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, let's clear this thing and let's only plot Stokes V. Okay, and it really is what we expect. It's an anti-symmetric profile which goes to zero as we go to the continuum. Yes. Is it could also be actually. Yes. It could be. So if we tune the wavelengths, maybe we would see Umbra at some point. But I think that Umbra is really dark. So we should really normalize with respect to the its own continuum. We should really look fractional polarization for each pixel separately and not normalize with one quiet sun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, no, no, it's vertical, so you expect high, circular, right? Circular polarization, yes. Okay, so let's look now, how does Stokes V, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot something which will not look li like a spectral line. I'm gonna calculate, sorry, this is the wrong presentation. I'm gonna calculate this, derivative, and I'm gonna plot, I'm gonna calculate this derivative in each point, and I'm gonna plot V versus this derivative to see if it behaves like a linear function, okay? So let's do that. The easiest way to do that in Python would be, I'll call it di over dl, and we do something like this, np gradient of the profile, so it's Stokes FE 130, 350, zero, divided by NP gradient of wavelength, right? It's VFE. Cool. 
and then I'm going to do plot, I'm going to clear the plot and I'm going to go plot this derivative as an independent quantity and Stokes V as dependent quantity and I'm going to plot points. It looks like this. Maybe, yeah, sorry for the, for the simple size, but I don't know by heart how to change it. Uh, but you, mo you most see that actually these things, this does look like a linear function, which actually also more or less goes through the zero, right? So this is Stokes V, this is di over d lambda. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fit this with the linear relationship. So if you look, if you look at the equation that we have here, we have that Stokes V is equal to minus 4.67 blah 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 times G times lambda squared times B. So it basically means Stokes V is di over d lambda times some constant and B is hiding in that constant. So let's find that constant. Since we have NumPy already imported, what we can do is we could just say k is mp uh, polyfit. And what do I want to fit? I want to fit this dependency here. I remember I have a mouse with the first degree polynomial, right? And I'm interested in k0. Okay, uh, it, uh, polyfitter range is the, the, the opposite. So k0 is the highest order. So since here we are fitting with kx plus n, we are interested in the, in the first one. Question for those who are bored is, is this one. And it's one of the hardest questions and I still don't know correct answer to that. And it's not unique to spectropolarimetry. Our model for interpretation of the data says that there is a linear relationship between V and di over d lambda. But it's not, it's, it's linear relationship of type e, e, epsilon equals kx. Should I fit it with epsilon equals kx or epsilon equals kx plus n or something else? We can discuss these answers later. Same is for Hubble constant, right? If you're determining Hubble constant, we have V is equal D times Hubble constant. Should I fit that with just epsilon equals KX or epsilon equals KX plus N or something else? But let's finish this and then we can discuss that later. Cool. So this is the coefficient of the, this is the, the, the slope, right? Let's go back and see what that slope actually is. That slope is B times lambda squared times lambda factor times minus, times this thing here. Okay, so to get the magnetic field, what I'm gonna do is B is equal to, let's hope this works, divided by 4.767 times E to the minus 13, divided by 6302.5 E to the minus, uh, well, no, no, it's in angstroms, so it's okay. This, uh, this equation is in angstroms and other things, so there you don't have to do any transformations. Divided by lambda factor, which is 2.49, and then minus print B, 1017. Does it make sense? Probably yes. 1000 is not an unreasonable quantity. The only way to know this is to do this for each pixel and then look at the map, right? So actually, since we are running out of time, sort of, I could go through you, with you through the process of writing the whole code, but I'm just gonna show you the code that we can use to do this. I hope it's here. Well, this is not gonna go like that. Yeah. So I'll unzoom it a little bit. So what I did is I created also a small script. There is a function called estimate b where you provide intensity, wavelength, Stokes V, lambda factor, line core wavelength. So this is wavelength grid, this is the wavelength of the line core. You calculate the gradient, you calculate the coefficients, and actually this should be corrected like, ah oh no, I have a zero up there, cool, okay. 
uh, you calculate B like this, and then it returns you this one number. And then in the core of the function, I open the FITS file, I read the data for Stokes, wavelength for, uh, so, sorry, uh, I'm absent. I, I load the data for iron line, wavelength for iron line, Stokes for calcium line, wavelength for calcium line. Then there are the line coefficients here, line de factor for iron, line de factor for calcium, line core for iron, line core for calcium. I go through all the arrays and I put my magnetic field in two arrays. BFE is magnetic field inferred from the iron. This is magnetic field inferred from calcium. So if we run this now, if, we're not, if we just run this as script from my Python, let's say run calc B with argument the name of your scan. It should take maybe a few seconds, minutes. So more time than is needed for the, definitely more time than is needed for VTF scan. So this code would be super bad for VTF if we want to have like real time estimation of the magnetic field. And then we're gonna take a look at these things when they're done. Maybe this is not even my glass, what am I doing? Okay, well this is being done, I'll go get my, get, go get my bottle, my, fl my flask. It's done. Oh, man. <laughs> Unconvenient timing. Okay. Now we need to solve something together because I noticed something weird and I don't know the answer. <coughs> Maybe Kevin can help us. Let's go clear the plot. Let's go image show BFE. Yeah. Uh, which color map? Uh, BWR. BWR. Why not? Because it's positive and negative values. Let's plot it from minus 2,000 Gauss to 2,000 Gauss. Fingers crossed. Oh, no, I didn't open. Okay. If I do show, it will should show. Amazing. Right. And we, let's set the color bar. Ah, no. Uh, yeah. We'll kill this. Let's do you know that you can start to make me install. I do, I hate that. Yes. So there are, here are some nice magnetic fields for you. And let's plot the color bar as well. Okay. So actually a lot of this is magnetized. It's strong, yes. Yes, yes. I mean, of course, the the... This is not going to be super correct for your sunspot because in sunspot the magnetic fields are strong. So weak field approximation is not strictly fulfilled. But actually it holds for a range of heights, right? It, it holds for a range of values. But now the trick is that when I calculated it from calcium, it doesn't look so good. You're not happy? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, we want nicer. So there is this, I mean, it's smoother. That's cool. Why is it smoother? Why is the magnetic field structure smoother when you look in the calcium with respect to the iron? Since it's formed higher up. Since it's formed higher up, right? The calcium is probing the chromosphere. In chromosphere, everything is more mellow in a way. The field, the field is more mellow. Not everything, not everything. Sorry, sorry, the field, the field. In photosphere, it's like this, like it's very compressed. Then as the, as the density decreases, the, the flux tubes expand, and then the things are more smooth. But the point is that I'm not sure when I plot the values, I expected them to be lower. So I don't know if this agrees with what we expect. And I'm not sure what to think about all these 
white details here. This is probably where the shape of the line in the intensity is just so twisted that this doesn't make sense. Because weak field approximation makes, makes more, more assumption is that, uh, that basically uh, every lot, uh, magnetic field is constant with depth. And, and it sort of will fail if our lines have very stupid shapes and so on and so on. But in principle, this tells you how you can do these things. And this is very fast and very robust method, right? There is nothing to explode here. You can get unreasonable quantity, but yes? Uh, I think I'm not so surprised by the map, because in the outside field that we had also in the iron, now our values are sensibly smaller. OK. And the weak field is probably better in the spot for a prosthetic Oh, yes, 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 so yes. Yeah. You actually get values in the spot while you did it yeah. Yes. yes. What? For what? Of that umbra, in which line? Okay, we can. Let's say. Let's. So Sebastian, what? How is it called in the file? Ah, with big S. So this is toxi in Umbra for calcium. Just the broad line. I mean, this is one of the reasons why the filter graphs are also a little bit tricky, right? You have this limited amount of wavelengths, and you're basically only sampling the core of the line here. It's not even the sample. Ah, it's not even the sample. Ah, sure, sure. So we should do like this. We should do like this. Uh, how is it? How is it called? VCA. Mm -hmm. So let's clear this. Let's clear this. Yeah, it's like this. Okay. Anyway, let's see the Stokes V because I mean, but but look at the number of counts here. It's super low. Super low, super low with respect to the other ones. Let's now plot the Stokes V. I think it's not so bad, right? Yeah, but it happens sort of when you plot. Let's do again uh, this. Let's again plot the. Uh, <coughs> So I'm just going to do this again. So I don't know what is meant, but OK. That's, that's the name of the unit. We wanted the points. So okay, actually, the, here the linear relationship is pretty reasonable. But you will see that if you plot them individually, you will see that sometimes it really seems off. And I think it also depends on like what sort of gradients we are seeing outside of the sunspot and so on and so on. So something that you should probably know is that this is not the only weak field approximation there you can also derive a weak field approximation for linear polarization it is a bit more complicated and you usually need to separate the line into like core regime and wing regime but in principle combining these two you should be able to estimate not only the strength of the uh, parallel field but also transversal field and the azimuth because Q and U, and did, this is what Christian said yesterday. He said that Q and U look exactly the same. They are just sort of, 
you know, the, basically their, their values, th 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 there cannot be crosstalk between Q and U. Their values will only mix depending on how you define your referent axis for defining the azimuth of the magnetic field. And basically, once you have defined that and you are sure about your Q and U, you can just, from the ratio of their magnitudes, you can define, you, 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 you can find the, the, the azimuth of that, right? But because always twice, two times azimuth goes into all equations, then we have something called magnetic field ambiguity. And that's the fact that, for example, if you have azimuth of 45 degrees and 225 degrees, they produce the compl exactly the same Stokes profiles. And we have to use other considerations to infer these orientations, to know whether it points like this or points like this. And then when you deal with the scattering polarization, there are even more ambiguities. That's everything that I had for today. We actually finished this faster than I thought. Does anybody have any questions or something doesn't work or you want to? Yes, go ahead. Ah, uh, ooh, I know one paper. Well, uh, sorry, the question was where to find the expressions for weak field approximation for linear polarization. If you look for papers by, the one that I know for sure has that equation is paper by Andres Asensio Ramos from a few years back where they infer magnetic field orientation using calcium 8542 in some sort of prominent, no, no, prominences some sort of fibrils or something like that. Uh, I can put the copy of the paper in the folder. And then I, in the new solar review by, uh, by Luis, okay. the weak field is nice and it's really... Okay, nice. so then look at, uh, it's probably quite sun magnetic fields. Quite sun magnetic fields by um, uh, Luis Bayot Rubio, uh, 2019 or 2018. Yeah. Yes, it's a huge paper though, like 100 and something pages. But he's an expert on quiet sun magnetic fields and diagnostics and so on, so you can find it there. Uh, the name of the, of the person? Luis Bayot Rubio. Bayot is B-E-L-L-O-T. -E More questions? I can put the papers in the folder, sure. Let's put them straight away. Let's not postpone things since we have extra time, right? So now I'm also using modern this. So this is the name of the author. That's, he has gazillions of papers, so let's just look last two years. Um, quiet sun magnetic fields and observational view. Ah, it's, Be it's Luis and, and David, okay. So, oh man, but are they not, ah yes they are. 124. I mean, this is just now un un unrelated to anything. I don't know if you know about living reviews in solar physics. It's a free journal which only the publishes reviews about solar system topics. It's run and managed by Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research Germany. And it's the solar physics journal with the highest impact factor. Obviously, because it only prints reviews. But there you can find amazing text on many things. There is a really good uh, review paper on inversions by Jose Carlos del Toro, Iniesta, and uh, Basilio Ruiz Cobo. There are reviews on granulation, inverse granulation, dynamo, quiet sun, chromosphere, I don't know what else. So it's, it's worth going through it. So yeah, let me download this and let me find another one. The other one could be something like this. B. 2016 or something like that. Yeah. This one, I think. Come on, A and A. I know you're sleeping and it's Europe, but we want the paper. So, yeah, this is the paper. And here they look at calcium 5542. They have 
clear signatures in Q and U and the equation is here one way uh, ah, of course you can you have it in uh, in the polarization spectral lines book but that one is hard to find relatively although it's an amazing book obviously but here you have expression so you see here that Q and U in weak field approximation depend on the second derivative of the intensity and that's not surprisingly we very often say that Stokes V is the effect of first order Stokes Q and U are the effects of the second order so yeah anyway I'm gonna put this paper also more questions I don't know if your physical model you, yeah the question is the que okay so the question is not solar physics related it's even if we had the equation which had form epsilon equals kx we fitted it with epsilon equals kx plus n and people will usually do that and I'm still I still have a mixed feeling about that one way is that you are fitting it with a straight line and then you can look at the intercept and you can see whether you have some systematics and if you're actually fitting like that, that you're getting rid of that systematics. Let's say that I had something in my data processing that shifted all my Stokes V profiles by some amount. Right? When I fit with epsilon equals kx plus n, that amount is going to automatically be properly subtracted, right? Because that amount just shifts my straight line in this scatter plot up and down, right? In principle, what I think we could do is that we, sh we should go Bayesian. We should cal calculate the full posterior, and then we mar marginalize over the intercept, which means we, we fit, we, we see probabilities for each of these combinations, and then we integrate this probability over the parameter we are not interested in, which is the intercept. But that's a long story which is best consumed with beer.